Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Two Girls Drink Beer. I'm Sienna. And I'm Danielle. And we are here with my friend Jason. Hey, Jason. Hi, ladies. How are you today? Good. Good. So Jason is a friend of mine from Improv. Danielle and Jason met each other exactly one time before this very moment. <laughs> and Jason's going to teach us about beer, and I'm going to stop drinking coffee. There you go. <laughs> what we're going to go through is a, is a beer tasting, kind of similar like they do, even do coffee or wine tastings. So this way, I find it is a really great way of uh, of understanding why you like the different styles of beer that you like and uh, and different ways of categorizing the beers that that you're drinking. So let me ask you actually a question. When you decide what, how do you decide on what beer you're gonna taste for, for your podcasts? It's kind of like whatever we're feeling at the moment or like, oh, I tried this and I need that in terms of her because that's a very Christina way of doing Oh, I tried this and I really like it, we need to do it. I, yeah, I think some of them have been like requests. Some of them, because of the whole COVID thing, for contactless stuff, we would do variety packs. Yeah. But it was also nice to do a variety pack because you could try like a Pilsner, an ale, an IPA, like a bunch of different kinds from one company. I will also say I'm very easily swayed by a good label. Throw a good label at me, I'm, I'm going to try it. Well, and, and that's another important reason why to like kind of focus on the tasting part of it is because we are swayed unconsciously by a lot of different things, right? No, some it's people, conscious. It's pretty <laughs> Well, some people go right to like the ABV part and be like, all right, this is like 8%. This is what I'm down with, right? And some of it, go, you know, so like packaging makes a difference. Appearance, like all of these kinds of things make a, a complete difference in the beer choices that we make. The whole important thing too is to making sh make sure that you are engaging all of your senses. One of the reasons why people take glasses at like and they and they cling them is is for the auditory experience of it, right? Because no matter if we're tasting food or tasting beer or wine or whatever, we're using our sense of sight by looking at the at what it looks like. We are very much using our sense of smell because our what we taste is about 80% what we smell. Then also the the taste part of it, obviously. Uh, the touch is like, there's something called mouthfeel, which I'll talk about in a second, is is how the beverage feels like when you start to drink it, right? And so the only thing that's really not included is the sense of sound. So that's why people clink glasses and cheer so that they get the auditory component of it as well, right? Or the, the, the glug, 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 glug. Yeah, we're gonna be tasting my, my Irish Red. It's our first, and as you can see, even the fact of me handwriting the R on the top and not having a label, right? It already says something about the beer itself, right? It does. <laughs> it, does. it feels naked. Yeah. It's like Winnie the Pooh without a shirt on. No, do you know what I feel like? I feel like I'm about to drink like root beer. For me, like every part, like even my uh, even my beer opener is like I, I I've gathered from my travels. So like I have, like I'm gonna be using a snifter glass uh, because there are different styles of glasses. So the more traditional is obviously the pint glass, which, uh, you know, which is very prevalent in most bars in the US. But then they have like uh, the snifter and it's got like a bigger body, a bottom and a little bit of a smaller top. So that this way, when you start to swirl the beer around, it, it, it's kind of the aroma is a little bit more focused. Then you also have like your, your Pilsner glass, which is a little bit taller and a little bit more narrow. And then you have your like Hefeweizen glass. Most of those, those glasses have the, like are very wide at the top. So the aroma just kind of diffuses. That's why I rec it's recommended that you use the snifter glass because then the aromas stay more concentrated within the glass. Different cultures get really particular about how to drink and how to serve a beer, right? Like, so it's not just, ah, I'm gonna dump it in a glass or I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna really be careful and make sure, and you could offend somebody by pairing the wrong beer with the wrong glass. They could get really uh, upset about that, you know? I needed another topic to overthink. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I had the whole paranoia song that I sing occasionally from time to time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I know the paranoia song. Oh, I suffer from paranoia. Paranoia, I suck from paranoia, and it's going to get you to hey. Well, that, that's definitely part of the auditory experience. <laughs> it's like a drink in the show. Exactly. <laughs> so you're, you're going to take your, take your beer, obviously open it, 
because it's hard to drink it without uncapping it. As soon as you uncap the beer, right? Like you can all, all, automatically start to smell the beer. When you're doing a tasting, you really only need to pour about an ounce and a half to two ounces of beer. You don't really need a whole lot. You don't need to just fill up the glass. So Stina, you, you poured yours down the side of the glass, right? Yeah. What you really want to do is kind of pour it into the glass so that it causes the, the carbonation to, to rise, right? What you want to do is you want to release the carbonation from within the beer because that's what'll give you a lot of the smell. If you don't uh, release the carbonation, it's gonna, it's not gonna release all of the aromas and they'll stay within the beer itself. So there's three things about the appearance. You're gonna wanna notice the head, like the foam that creates on the top. You're gonna wanna notice the color and also the clarity. Generally with homebrewed beers, they're gonna have a little bit of a haziness to it because they're unfiltered. When you filter a beer, is when it gets super clear. So like you can't even really see through the beer itself, right? Like you can't, yeah, if, if you try to see your fingers, you won't be able to see your fingers through the glass because there's that haze. And what that is, is most of it is a suspended yeast because it's not filtered out. The, the live yeast is still within the beer. Okay. Right, so you you still have a light a, a a lot of live yeast within within this beer, and then generally with home brewed, that's generally the case. Not always. Some some home brewers go through the process of filtering after everything is fermented and before bottling. Uh, so so it's not always the case, but for many home brewers, you're going to have a little bit of a hazier beer than you would from a commercial you know brewery, and then you're going to want to start to circle the glass. And what that does is it starts to, you know, it, it gets the carbonation really going and gets the aromas out. So yes, you can totally stick your nose in it, right? <laughs> right. But what's going to happen is many of the, the aromas in the beer itself, when you jam your nose in there, will some of the subtle uh, aromas will get overpowered. You want to start by bringing it like kind of rocking it back and forth under your chin, right? And you, there's tons and tons of aromas that you can smell. You may smell something floral. You generally this uh, with with the Irish red, you're going to smell a little bit of a nuttier, maybe a caramelly flavor to it. And they call this kind of like the drive by smelling, right? Like the drive by aroma. Then you can swirl it again, stick your nose in there and take two short sniffs. It'll smell a little bit different than what when you kind of did the rocking, right? So what what kind of aromas are you getting? I definitely smell a nutty. I yeah. do. I do too. Now I am by no means an expert in sensory evaluation of, of beer or of it, but because it really takes a lot of fine tuning and a lot of doing it over and over and over again to pick out those really subtle kind of flavors. The third way is kind of what you did before is that sticking your nose in it. The fourth way though. And it, uh, uh, that you and you can pick whichever way. You don't have to do all four of these whenever you're tasting a beer, but whichever kind of like uh, moves you. You can cut your hand over the beer, give it a swirl, and that'll kind of trap everything in, and then kind of stick your nose in it. Each way, you're you're gonna get a little something different in the beer. Now there the uh, aromas that you're gonna get. Like they could, you know, there's so many different, you could actually even go on the, on Google, like you can Google like a beer uh, aroma, like, and there's a whole lot of different things from, you know, nutty, floral, woodsy, smoky. And this is even before you taste it because uh, taste is about 80% uh, smell because we can only taste literally five things, uh, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and there's a fifth one. It used to be called, I think, astringent, but it's now called umami. It's Japanese for like savory and fermented. Did you ever see the Friends episode? I'm sure I have. I've seen, I have all 10, I, I don't want to really admit this, but I have all 10 <laughs> seasons, yeah. The episode with Ross where he says that he has unagi, but really unagi is like an eel that's in sushi and he's trying to say umami. So that kind of combination with the aroma is is what we're is really what it's mostly aroma is what we taste and now we're going to actually taste it so when you taste it you want to take a sip you want to let it coat the tongue but not let it float the tongue right like so you want just enough to cover the tongue 
but not to like saturate it completely. It's called the mouth feel. So how does it feel on the tongue? We also want to notice the body of the, of the beer itself. So if you're thinking of it, think about milk, right? If you drink water, it's very light. If you drink skim milk, it has a little bit of body, but not too much. If you drink heavy cream, it's got a lot of body, right? So, but it's about the weight of the beer on the tongue. It's also, you want to feel for the carbonation, like how, like, does it kind of lay flat or does it, you can feel like a little tiny little bubbles. And the other thing is the aftertaste. After it goes down, is there anything that lingers behind, right? Because there are some beers where the oils sit on your tongue and you may love the first sip of it, but like 10 sips in, you're like, oh, I don't know if I really totally dig this. And it could be because of the aftertaste and the build up of the oils over the course. And they call that drinkability. Now let's taste it up. I feel like I've had something like this before. The aftertaste, it's good, Jason. It is good. <laughs> it's good. I think I was trying to pinpoint the beer that it tasted like, but I think the aftertaste does taste very nutty. It yeah. definitely, you can, I can definitely taste the bitterness in there. It has a subtle bitterness, like kind of towards the end of, you know, of the, of the, of the, as far as the body goes, it has like a, it's like a medium body because it's not heavy like a, like no. a stout, nor is it super light like a, uh, like a Pilsner or, you know, something like that. Definitely medium bodied. The carbonation, like, and I'm, I'm still playing around with the carbonation, depending on how long it always sits in my, uh, in my basement. Like, so when it's, when it's first ready to drink, there's not a whole lot of carbonation. And then, but, you know, if I let it sit for too long, then the carbonation builds up over time. I've had a red before. There's a, well, I've, we've talked about it on this YouTube channel before. There's a bar in New York City called Rudy's, and they make oh, their own right. red. It tastes completely different than this, but this is very, very good. I'm glad. When you say something that, as a red beer, like it has general characteristics, but every component. So beer is only really four ingredients altogether. It's like it's water, barley, yeast, and hops. Any variation, even just changing the yeast, can can make a huge difference in the flavor. Of, of the beer. Some places use one strain of yeast and they keep cultivating it over and over again so that they, so that their, their yeast takes on the characteristics of their beer. I'm just thinking of, have you ever watched the Great British Baking Show? Yeah. Mm. A Great sure. British Baking Show, but for beer brewing. There are beer clubs that, where they do competitions and they do, like they do stuff like that. It's not like, because it takes a month to to, from beginning to end to drinkable, they don't do it like in person like that. But you, you know, you can go to like, uh, they do have homebrew cons and stuff like that, where there are people brewing beers like on site, and then they have competitions, you know, of, of the finished product. That's why I love home brewing because it's so social. And it's not really, it, it's about the beer, but it's about connecting over the beer and having a, a relationship with not just people, but relationships with the beer itself and different styles and, you know, uh, knowing what you like and what you don't like. And, and it's just a, a really fun, you know, thing to get into. The last thing that we do is we talk about food pairings. Can yeah, yeah. We, can we take a moment? I don't know if you had anything else, but can we talk about what we would eat with this? Or is there a certain way that we should talk about that now as we become <laughs> beer connoisseurs? <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm not that uh, I'm not that proficient in talking about. It. <laughs> the more you understand how to taste a beer, and the more defined your sense of smell and taste can get, right? Then you can you can figure out like what you would want to pair it with. So if you have something like general, like if you have a very bold meal, like let's say you're a meat eater and you're having like a steak, right? You you, you may need a uh, you may need a bolder beer to pair with it because you don't want it to get lost. Or you can go the opposite way and go with a really light beer as a contrast. So, you know, there, there's a lot of different, um, you know, there's a lot of different theories on pairing foods. That's um, so interesting because um, there was a time when Danielle and I did a sour session. I think it was Dogfish Head on okay. the table, And I doubled down on the flavor. Yeah. And she went in the other direction. I was like, this would be good with, like, I, th I think I said, like, a chicken, something with, like, a lemon-lime, like, yeah. dressing or something. 
And right. she said, I think I would go in a different direction. So it's interesting that you say that because I've noticed that sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I double down on the flavor and Danielle takes it and I try contrast. something to, to complement it as opposed to going more intense with that same flavor. Yeah, yeah. And like sometimes when you have like something really sour, right? Like you can go with something sweet and then, <laughs> you know, like one of my favorite, like I love the salty sweet combination. So, yeah. you know, you know, but some people, you know, that don't care for that in particular. They they like they double down on you know on on the flavor, which is a way. It's a way to go, and and it's getting to know what you like and how you would pair things you know for yourself. If you were to if you were to eat something with the beer that you made, what do you think it would be? Because I would love to have this with like a cheese and cracker board. Like this, I feel like would be a good beer that goes that with with cheese. I know. <laughs> Sorry, we just did too terrible. See, because it's like an Irish style red, you can easily do it with like a fish and chips would be good, which would be really nice. Because it's an Irish red, it sort of has that like nutty, little bit of a bready kind of flavor to it. It would really go well with the fish and chips or, you know, or or I can always go, I can always go for a pretzel. We say pretzel. All the time. Or like burger for like every beer. Even some sort of like, maybe like even a vegetable stew, like a vegetable pot pie kind of thing. Oh. Um, something, you know, something a little bit on, um, it could not like a salad or anything because it, it, it is a little bit on the medium bodied side. So you'd want something that has some sort of substance to it. Something warm. I was thinking of a pot pie myself just because like, the weather's starting to change. It's starting to be mm -hmm. that pot pie time of year. What I also do is I change the beer. Like I have to plan about a month in advance. So this was my latest brew. But like during the summer, I did more of the lighter beers. Like I, I uh, shared with Christina the, Christina the Hefeweizen and the Heineken clone that I did. Right. To keep it on the lighter side. Because, it, you know, taking the beers and even talking about the beers with seasons, thinking about the beer with the seasons that you're in is also, I mean, that's when I, when I kind of plan out my little brewing schedule, it, re I really think, take that into consideration because like in the, in the winter, I like, you know, red, like a little bit of a he heavier beer because it's cold outside. It kind of warms up the, it's a little heavier and warms up the, the body a little bit more than the lighter stuff. You know, and, and then in the summer, it's all like the, the Pilsner and Hefeweizen and IPAs and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, if you think of the clothing, you know, when it's, uh, when it's cold out, we put on a lot more stuff. We, we wear heavier clothing than when it's light, you know, summer out. So like I, my, I feel like I like my clothes. It depends on the season. I like my beer, like my clothes. Exactly. Yeah, I actually so. had a moment this week where I was wearing a sweatshirt and I felt like I needed to put on a second sweatshirt. It was that cold. Thank you, Jason, very Jason, much. Yes, thank you so much for sharing this with us because this is You're really, really good. We'll have better glasses next time. We're working with a square situation, so swirling is a little bit swirling difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Just to let everybody know, Jason will be back. He has a couple more beers for us to try. Thanks, everybody. Like and subscribe if you haven't yet. If you haven't, I don't know what the hell you're waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> I've been at this for a while now. Let's go. Cheers to you, Jason. Cheers. Thanks again. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Bye.